uh, standard announcements. Uh, there's a homework that's available on Canvas. Um, you're implementing SVM and logistic regression and optionally a new kind of an ensemble where you train some decision trees and a linear classifier on top of that. Uh, this homework might, uh, you know, it, I think it's the largest amo amount of implementation that you'll have in the semester. So, you know, I, I would recommend get started soon. And uh, the side effect is that by doing the homework, you also get, you have code that can also work for your project. So you, you get double the amount of work for the same uh, uh, effort. Uh, the homework, to remind you, is due on the 23rd. And the final project is also due on the 23rd, but with a asterisk next to it, um, that the submission window will stay open till April 30th. And there will be no penalty for submitting during the exam time. Uh, and the final exam, speaking of exams, the final exam is on the 25th at 10.30 a.m. And it covers everything, including uh, learn everything in the second half of the semester, plus all of learning kids. Are there any questions? Yes. Can you share the index first for everyone? Yeah, um, yeah, I will. Um, uh, so can you remind me of sometime in the evening? I'll, uh, I'll put it up, or one of us will put it up. Yes. Has the Kaggle submission time changed? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's still it, it, the Kaggle submission is still the twenty fifth. Uh, I think that part is going to be tricky to change. So the you can submit whatever you have to submit on re, the report um, till the 30th, but make sure you get all your uploads onto Kaggle uh, by the 25th. Yeah. No, let's just say it's a bug and get done with it. Um, because I, I, I'm kind of a little bit uncomfortable asking you to do more work during the exam time. I would rather incentivize you to get it done and get it out of the way. Uh, so the Kaggle submissions, and also the other thing the, that comes up around this time is you're limited to a certain number of submissions on Kaggle per day. I think the limit is four. Yeah, four or six. Four, four, four. Four. So um, you might want to plan around that. Uh, if, if there are, I've had situations where a student emails me on the last day uh, saying, I need to submit 20 submissions today. Don't do that. Don't be that person. Uh, plan ahead and you know uh, schedule your submissions on time. Um, the, there's a question uh, on Zoom. If we are submitting .ipy, uh, IPython files. Do you want us to submit the shell code or anything with it? Actually, for this one, Jupyter notebook files are uh, okay. I'm, I'm assuming this is for Kaggle. Uh, so for that, the Jupyter uh, files would be okay. Just give some instructions on what we need to have to run it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to install anything on the Cade Lab uh, machines. Um, so make sure that it works in that environment. There was uh, a question just before we started related to the homework, and I want to address that. Um, so there's a in your homework, uh, this, this is also an interesting point to mention independently of that. In your homework, you're not measuring accuracy. You're me measuring precision recall and F score. These are other metrics that we may use. And the general rule of thumb is in a classification problem, when you have uh, uh, or a binary classification problem, when you have imbalance in the labels. Accuracy could be misleading. So let me give you an example. Suppose you have a binary classification problem where there are a thousand positive examples and one negative example. And I tell you that I have a classifier that is 90% accurate. Is my classifier any good? So I have thousand positive and one negative example. A 90% classifier on this, let's not do 1,000, let's make our math easy. So 999, positive and 
one negative. Among these thousand examples, a 90% classifier gets 900 examples right. I could do better than that by just getting positive. Mm. If I say every label is positive, I'm getting 99.9% .9 accuracy. Mm. That looks impressive until you realize that the negative class is never predicted. So when you have imbalance in the classes, uh, you should automatically be suspicious of accuracy measurement because it's possible to get high looking accuracies when uh, uh, without actually doing anything. And a good answer there, or, or a standard answer there, is uh, not to measure accuracy, but to measure something called precision, recall, and F-score. The precision, so, so, let's, uh, so let's say you have, let me make my math easy. Let's say you have 90 positive and 10 negative examples. And let's say among these 90 positive examples, my classifier predicts um, say 80 of them as positive and the remaining 10 as negative. This is uh, round two. And this is prediction. Mm -hmm. So among the 90 positives, it predicts 80 plus and 10 minuses. And among the 10 minuses, it predicts one of them as positive and nine of them as negative. This sort of a table is called a confusion table or a contingency table, I think, where you list out uh, a cross product of all the labels. Uh, one, one uh, uh, the rows of the table could be the ground truth and the columns are the prediction. This, you can build this kind of a table also for when you have more than two labels. These things here, the 80, these things here are positive examples that are also positive predictions. So these are called true positives. So let me write that here. These are called true positives and these are called true negative. So the true negative is negative examples that are predicted as negative. This here is a negative example that's falsely predicted as a positive. So it's called a false positive. And this thing here, these 10 are, a, are positive examples that are falsely predicted as negative. So these are called false negative. So the way to remember this is a false positive is falsely predicted as positive. A false negative is falsely predicted as negative. Now, precision is a metric that says among, let me just remove Precision is a metric that says among the examples that were predicted as positive, how many of them are actually positive? So if my classifier says predicts the label plus, how precise is it? So precision can, uh, is defined as the true positive divided by true positive plus false positive. Recall is asking among all the examples that were supposed to be positive, how many did my classifier discover? How many did it reco recollect? Given? So recall is is two positive divided by in this case, your precision would be 80 divided by 81 and your recall is 80 divided by 90. So I'm just giving this as an example. This, the, you can extend this to more than two classes also. Then you will have precision for each label and recall for each label. Among examples that were predicted for that label by the model, how many of them were actually that? And recall is among all the examples that were truly that label, how many examples were predicted to be that? Uh, these are just two metrics. So you have a precision and a recall. And typically you tend to get classifiers not uh, being equally good at both of them. So you, you might get a model that that has high precision, low recall, or high recall, low precision. Uh, and there might be an incentive to find, uh, combine them into a single number that you can then use to rank models, for example, with uh, cross-validation. One way of combining it is something called the F score. Let me make all of this smaller. 
Then you have the F score, which is defined to be the harmonic mean. It's called the, uh, the, the something. This is what I'm defining now. It's called the F one score. Um, there's generalizations of that that you can look up on your own. The F score is defined to be the harmonic mean of precision and recall. Harmonic mean, if you've not seen it before, is another kind of a mean, like an arithmetic mean and a geometric mean. Arithmetic mean is just the average. Uh, the geometric mean is the square root of the product. The harmonic mean is defined to be a number f that satisfies this property. If you rearrange all of this, you get f1 really is okay. Um, and if you want to know the history of why the f1 score is defined that way, there is it's kind of lost in detail. Uh, there, there's some hints that it came from the information retrieval community and uh, from maybe in the 1970s or something like that. Anyway, the, the details are irrelevant. This has now become the standard thing. People often, uh, you know, in papers, you might find a table that has P slash R slash F, precision recall and F score. And F score is just a composite metric of precision and recall. You should automatically think precision recall F1 if your label set has imbalance. The homework uh, data set that you have has imbalance. So that's why you're uh, being asked to measure precision recall and F4. And when you're doing cross validation, you need to do cross validation not with accuracy, but with the average F score. So find hyperparameters that give the best average F score. Any questions about this before, we, before I get to the actual question that triggered this whole discussion? So F score is uh, overall matching to say is uh, so higher F score is better. So the, uh, the, let's take the extreme case when both precision and recall are both one, then F score becomes one, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the perfect F score is when both precision and recall are high. So increasing either one of those increases the F score. Mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of uh, think about this a little bit, uh, if you look at it a little bit more deeply, consider uh, the case where, um, let's consider a classifier that has high precision and low recall. Or oh, actually, let's do the opposite. Let's say I want a classifier that has high recall and low precision. The way to get high recall, remember, recall is using is this quantity divided by the sum of that. Actually, it is this divided by this. One way to achieve high recall is, did I, did I make this wrong? Let me wrong. Yeah. yeah, so one way to achieve high recall is you predict everything as positive. If you predict every example as positive, then the number of true positives is all the positive examples. In this case, it will be 90. Mm -hmm. And the remaining 10 that you made a mistake on would go into false positives. It's not going to go here. So the recall among all the 90 positives, 90 of them were discovered by the classifier, so recall is 100%. But what would the precision of that classifier be? If you have a classifier that only predicts plus, the precision of the classifier would be 90%. It seems pretty high. Something is wrong here. I think I made a mistake here somewhere. Uh, usually, when you predict every all examples are the same label, you get uh, uh, you get fifty percent recall. So I, I, I sorry, it's because of the imbalance here. So the, the, there's a there's something funny going on. The 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 real thing I wanted to get to here is consider the case where you we have a classifier um, that predicts nothing uh, that does not actually predict positive at all. It makes no positive prediction, meaning let's consider, let's, let me erase these numbers here. So you have zero here, zero here, 90 and 10. So it always predicts every example is negative. So what would the recall be? Zero. And what would the precision be? Number. It seems like it's not a number. It's zero divided by zero. Yes. Um, the convention here is 
the precision of that classifier is one hundred percent. Why? Among all the positive examples that that were predicted, all the positive examples that were predicted were correct. Trivial. How many how many positive examples were predicted? Zero. How many of them are correct? All of them. So precision is conventionally defined to be hundred percent when you get the zero by zero. And uh, so uh, this might this situation might happen in your in your homework when you're doing cross validation. So when you're measuring precision and recall, make sure that if there is a zero by zero, uh, by convention, it becomes one. Any questions? There's a question on Zoom about logistic regression. I'll get to that later. There are other standard evaluation methods. In the class so far, we have encountered three, just to remind you. We've seen accuracy of uh, classifiers. We've seen precision recall F1. And for regression, you use neither accuracy nor any of this. You just use the square error. So for regression, the natural metric is the squared, mean squared error. You should always tailor the evaluation to the nature of the problem because sometimes it may it just may not fit. Yeah. So so we just say actual score is higher is better than F score, the higher is better. In general, the way machine learning metrics are designed, higher is always better. And mean square error is an exception. Lower error is good, but uh, let's not go there. Okay, I, I want to switch gears here. There's a question on uh, Zoom about logistic regression. How does the objective function of SGD that uses, sorry, uh, objective function of logistic regression using SGD dif differ from the objective function of map logistic regression? Uh, this is uh, the it, the answer to the question is they are the same thing. SGD is an algorithm that's used to optimize an objective. It does not care about how the objective came along. So if we want to use uh, stochastic gradient descent to optimize the objective that we derived using maximum a posteriori, that's fine. So uh, the, the maximum a posteriori is a criterion that can be used to invent objective functions. Stochastic gradient descent is an algorithm that can optimize any objective function. Um, so these are two uh, different things, but that's a technical question. So I, I, I don't know if there's a follow-up. Or any other questions? Homework, project, etc. There was also a, qu a question on uh, Piazza about a study guide for the final exam. There will be one showing up sometime over the weekend. But this homework, we don't have the uh, latex sourcing. Yeah, uh, that was uh, someone asked that uh, it will show up uh, this evening. There will be a latex source this evening. Later? Later today. So, so and if, also, this homework, we can have the data. Right? You said the project, we will not update the data. Data file. What do you mean? The, the data file. Yes. Because in the end, we need to write the script to make sure our code is run. So I, I'm curious uh, if we can upload the data. Yeah, we can... Why do you need to upload the data? Yeah, sure, upload the data. Yeah. If it fits, go for it. Because it's in the past, we can, we can write the script. To... Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. If, if it works. But why could not do that? Because the project data is huge. It's the, the data size is so, so. We can assume the data is in the working. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another uh, question in, uh, uh, do we examine the bias in both the training and the test data and then decide to use precision recall and F-score or do we always use accuracy when testing? This is an interesting question. Uh, we always examine uh, these sorts of imbalances and such things only on the training data. And once we pick a metric, Usually when I say we measure this, we measure this on the test data. So this would be the official evaluation because remember the, the, the assumption that we started off this whole game was uh, that the training data and the test data and any future data comes from the same distribution, which means if the training data has an imbalance, 
it's a reasonable assumption that future examples will also be imbalanced, will have a class imbalance. And so there's no reason not to use the same metric. Um, there is a little bit more that goes into uh, the class imbalance can cause other problems, which uh, um, shows up when you're doing cross-validation, but I don't want to go into that right now. Uh, we can just assume uh, that the distribution of labels in the training data reflects the distribution of labels in future examples. And so if we decide to use precision recall F-score for doing cross-validation, we're going to report precision recall F-score. So the, does that answer your question, Hollis? Or I need something which I have to use this F-score to count the training sample. For cross-validation. Okay. Cross for the test sample. You use the same valuation. Okay. Yes. Okay. So all of that aside, we're going to start a new topic today. Today we're going to look at neural networks. Um, We'll start looking at neural networks today and uh, continue next week um, and see how far we go with that. Just to take stock of where we are, we've seen a few different learning algorithms. We've seen the ID3 algorithm for decision trees, perceptron, atomos, support vector machines, logistic regression, um, and variants of several of these. Along the way, we've also encountered general principles related to machine learning. Um, we looked at this notion of overfitting, which all of these models can do. Um, we looked at machine mistake-bound learning. Uh, in particular, we looked at the perceptron algorithm through that lens. Um, we looked at pack learning and sam sample complexity as a mechanism to decide, uh, uh, define what successful learning is. And in that context, we looked at the importance of how the importance of choosing a hypothesis space, and uh, we see dimensions and such things. Um, the, the, uh, we also look, related to overfitting, we looked at the difference between the generalization error of a model and the training error and uh, uh, the important sort of overarching principle that we drew from all of this was the idea that we can frame learning as, um, uh, as the problem, as an optimization problem, as a problem of minimizing an, uh, a function for a loss loss uh, is simply the penalty that you assign to a model for to overfitting. The perfect classifier on the training data will have zero loss, and that's really not the best classifier with respect to generalization. Error. And so we have not just loss minimization, but we have regularized loss minimization. And the regularization term serves to impose a preference over the classifiers, over the models. Um, and then uh, most recently, we looked at another way to ask the question, what does it mean to learn? And this was the Bayesian perspective. We looked at the maximum a posteriori and the maximum likelihood criteria, uh, which it turns out for different classes of models also end up leading to optimization problems that you can uh, now look at through a different lens, namely through loss minimization. All these general principles apply across the board here. I mean, you can view all, uh, different algorithms through the same lens. For example, there are Bayesian strategies to think about the vision trees. Uh, and most we presented it, uh, we looked at it as a, um, as a mechanism for uh, involving weak and strong learners, but it turns out it also uh, behaves like a loss minimization uh, algorithm for a certain definition of a loss and so on. So Ceptron, minimizes the perceptron loss. So a lot of these things are uh, connected. One thing that you should notice is most of the models that we looked at in the semester, uh, most of the hypothesis spaces involved linear classifiers. Perceptron was the first instance that we saw, our first learning algorithm for linear classifiers. Uh, Adaboost is a linear classifier over the weak classifiers. Um, over the predictions of the weak classifiers. So if your weak classifiers were just individual features, then you just get a linear classifier. Support vector machines and logistic regression, it turns out they're also linear classifiers. So this, of course, 
uh, clearly points out that we have not covered the uh, covered everything that we can. In particular, there are a couple of issues that we did not look at. What if we need to train a nonlinear classifier? You might ask, why do we need to train a nonlinear classifier? The answer could be the phenomenon that you're trying to model in nature, you know it to be nonlinear. So how do we train a nonlinear classifier? And one answer to that is you take your features and apply some feature transformations so that you uh, you match the uh, nonlinearity that might appear in nature. But that only raises the question of what features, where do the features come from, and how do you know what feature transformations to apply? This is roughly where we are. This is a one slide summary of nearly everything we saw in the semester. So the, in this lecture, we're going to look at neural networks. Um, it's a hypothesis class. It's actually not a hypothesis class. There's no one thing called a neural network. It's a, a sort of a, a language for describing large families of functions. And uh, so I'll, first we'll look at what this set of functions are. So like as with any class, any new hypothesis class, there are three questions to answer. What is the set of functions? How do you make predictions with it? And how do you train it? And then when we start thinking about how to implement it and use it, we have to address that practical concern. So this will be the entirety of the neural network lecture. My hope is we'll be able to get to somewhere um, here today, and then we'll pick up from here next week. So let's look at what uh, neural networks are and what kinds of things they can express. We've seen linear threshold. Now this is a cartoon picture um, that shows a linear classifier um, um, uh, in, with four features. And the way this works is you have four features, x1, x2, x3, and x4. Um, this just says, and when x1 travels along this wire, it gets multiplied with w1. And uh, when x4 travels along this wire, it gets multiplied with w4. There's an extra bias feature that is always 1. And when it travels along this feature, it gets multiplied by b. Which And in this place, all the things, all the inputs get added. So we have w1, x1, plus w2, x2, plus and so on, plus b which is nothing but a dot product. And this is, uh, a, a, and the standard thing that we do with linear classifiers is we take that quantity and look at the sign of that. In other words, instead of saying, we look at the sign of that, I can say, we threshold it at zero. If that number is more than zero, we say the label is one. If that number is less than zero, we say the label is minus one. So the prediction is simply the sign of W transport X plus B. And for this device here, we've looked at many different learning algorithms. Uh, Perceptron, SEM, logistic regression, there are other algorithms that we did not look at as well. And generally, this feels like uh, a common unifying theme is we minimize some definition of loss over this function class. The thing that we did not address is where, where we get these inputs from. Where do we get these input features, x1, x2, x3, x4? And one way to kind of uh, uh, conceptualize this is these features are just numbers. They are, think of them as sensor readings from some, um, from some sensor. What if these features were themselves the output of a different model? Each feature was an output of a different model. So there, are, there is, imagine that you have uh, a raw input. Let's say now the x's are raw inputs. By raw input, I mean, say, a photograph or just um, a raw text from some uh, book or an email or such things, objects in the real world. And we need to make a prediction about it. For that, we need to somehow convert it to features. So let's separate out the raw inputs from the prediction part. And rather than uh, just to keep, keep things simple, let's say that uh, the prediction still depends on some four features. Let's say that the first input to the classifier itself came from a different classifier. 
The second input came from a different classifier. The third one came from a different classifier, and so on. What I, what I have built here is called a two-layer feed-forward neural network. Why is it called a two-layer feed-forward neural network? Uh, there are there is something called the hidden layer, and there's there's an output layer. There's of course the input layer. Uh, the input is always there. Think of this hidden layer as a good feature representation of the uh, inputs for this task. But rather than you designing the feature or you applying whatever feature transformation is necessary, you are learning the feature transformation along the way. That's the high level uh, uh, goal here. The output um, is, uh, in this case, created by a dot product applied to some transformed representation uh, followed by a threshold. This object represents an artificial neuron. In this picture, we have five of them. This is one of them. And then you have another three, four, and five. So you have five uh, neurons in this neural network. Four of them are in the hidden layer, and one of them is in the output layer. Any questions? All I've shown here is a cartoon example. You can't do much with this right now. But there is, an, there is an interesting thing here. I'm assuming that the features for the hidden layer are known to us. So x1, x2, x3, x4 are some representation of the input. Where do they come from? Well, maybe they are outputs of a different classifier or a different model. So we can introduce another layer that separates the raw inputs and this hidden layer. Then we'll get a three-layer neural network. You keep doing this, and uh, you can keep building larger and larger uh, neural networks. Um, this particular style of neural network is called a multi-layer perceptron for historical reasons, because it's, it's, each of these things looks like a perceptron, and you have many of them. You have layers of them. Before I formalize this, any thoughts or questions or observations about this sort of an example? Ah, there's a question. Can we go back, go from the output back to the input? So that's a fun question. Can I have this feeding back here maybe? Um, for now, let's say no. In fact, I would, I'm going to actually very soon when I formalize this, I'll say, no, that's not allowed. Our neural, every neural network, no neural network is allowed to have a cycle. The another question is why is the value of each dot product? Ah, good. So the question is we have four hidden units here. One, two, three, four. What would make the values of the dot product in that computed here different from the dot product computed here? And the answer is the weights on these wires going into this are different from the weights on this one. So each of those hidden layers, hidden units, has its own weights. That way we get, think of it as different feature transformations applied to uh, uh, the different feature transformations are being applied to the same input to get four different features in this case. Uh, another question related to the fact that uh, you can't have cycles. What does the term feed forward in the name mean? Feed forward simply means that uh, the information goes in the forward direction from the input to the output. Uh, there are historical reasons for this. Uh, I, I don't want to get into the uh, nomenclature yet. Um, but feed, for now, pretty much all neural networks that we use are feed forward networks. And then another question. So. If follow up to the fact that each of these weights are different, is how are those weights learned? And the answer is 
all the weights on this entire, every edge in this thing is associated with the weight and all the weights are learned together. We just throw it into a loss function and hope it works. And while that may seem a little frivolous, the answer is it works, which is crazy, which is actually pretty cool that it does. Okay, I, I can see that uh, based on the questions that people are eager for formalization. So let's let's make this a little bit more concrete. A neural network is a robust uh, class of hypotheses for real valued functions, for approximating real valued, real valued functions, discrete valued functions, or vector valued functions. Uh, today, it's among the best and, uh, or the most effective general purpose approximation machines, uh, which means it's also among the most uh, effective uh, hypotheses, hypothesis for supervised learning. This tends to be especially helpful for data that is um, complex and hard for humans to interpret. For example, if I ask, what is a cat? Of course, you can tell me what a cat is, but if, if I ask you, give me a program that uh, can identify the image of a cat, uh, identify a cat in an image. You can't actually say what that program will have. More, more, more importantly, you may not even be able to specify what exact features your uh, program should look at, given the input, uh, the input assuming that it's an image. You can say a cat has a tail and a fur and such things, but now you've just made the problem more complicated. What's a tail? What's fur? How, uh, all the, the input only has pixels. So we have data that is very difficult to describe uh, in a programmatic way and even, even at the level of features. Now, the strength of neural networks comes not from not just from the fact that they are an expressive class of functions, but also from this algorithm called backpropagation. Backpropagation allows us to um, take advantage of gradient-based learning for you know, So it allows us, to, it essentially is a subroutine inside a learning algorithm for any neural network architecture, which has allowed us to explore neural network families uh, in this explosive way that uh, we've seen in the last maybe, uh, 15 years. And uh, it, it, neural networks have been shown to be successful across a wide variety of application domains. When people think neural networks, people who may not have seen um, artificial neural networks formally, you might immediately, people might immediately think of biological neurons. This is a drawing, a famous drawing by uh, Santiago Ramon Ecayal, who was the first person to draw uh, brain cells by observing them. And uh, neurons, of course, are a big part of uh, our nervous system. Uh, they consist of things like axons and dendrites, whatever they mean. Um, all of that is great. Just want you to know that modern artificial neural networks are only loosely inspired by biological neural networks. There are fundamental differences that make them so incompatible with each other that anytime someone says, uh, I have this neural network because the brain works this way, I know that they don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, don't take those claims too seriously. Just like, you know, you shouldn't take a hyperbole about AI from New York Times. So let's, uh, this is pretty much all I'm going to talk about biological neurons because that's really not what this class is about. Let's talk about artificial neurons. Artificial neurons are mathematically functions that loosely mimic a biological neuron and very loosely mimic a biological neuron. Con uh, concretely, a neuron is a function that takes an input that's a vector and produces an output. To produce the output, it takes the input and uh, computes a dot product of that input with some weights that it has and adds a bias term, just like we see with uh, uh, all the linear classifiers and all those things. And then you get a number, right? You have a, a dot product of weights and bias and you add a bias, uh, sorry, dot product of weights and the uh, uh, input and you get a bias. So this is W transpose X plus B, that's a number. And then you apply, uh, the neuron then applies a nonlinear transformation to that number. 
possibly non linear there are neurons that are also linear that transformation is called an activation function so and we'll talk about activation functions in a bit so a, a neuron takes an input x and produces an output by applying an activation to uh, 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 to w transpose x plus b and w and b are w is a vector and b is a number and think of these as the parameters that define the neural network. So here we have, for example, uh, just to show, uh, you know, uh, point out what these different parts are here. Everything that's happening here is step one, apply a dot product and uh, um, add a bias. And then you get a real number. And this is step two. There is a nonlinear transformation. In particular, the step, uh, the sine function that we've been using with all our linear classifiers so far, is nothing but some. Uh, it's nothing but uh, an activation function called the threshold activation. The threshold activation takes a number, and if that number is more than zero, it returns plus one. If that number is less than zero, it returns minus one. Other activation functions are um, exist in the literature, and we'll I'll show you a few examples of some of them. But before that, any questions? We've seen a single neuron. We've, in fact, a good part of the semester uh, is has been about a linear classifier. A linear classifier is literally a threshold activation applied, uh, a, new, a single neuron with a threshold activation. Because, you know, functionally, they are the same. Yes. Um, very good question. Uh, the choice of the activation function tends to be a design choice. Um, uh, how do you know what's a good activation function? You pick one and hope it works. Or you rely on certain theorems from the 90s that say, for with, within reason, certain uh, with, for a large family of activation functions, this, the choice that you make doesn't matter uh, with, with respect to how well it can approximate uh, any function. Yes. So the output of the activation is the, the real number. It's a real number. In this case, it's a real number, but in this case, for a threshold activation, it's either minus one or one. But in general, it's a real number. Could be any event. Different activation functions have different ranges. So let's look at some activation functions to give you some examples. Some in older neural network literature, I've seen it also being referred to as transfer functions. I don't see it much uh, these days. Uh, there's a question: Is the activation function part of the hidden layer? Uh, it can be more complicated for complex hidden layers. Yeah, it, it's part. It can be part of the hidden layer. It can be part of the output layer. Every neuron is going to have its own activation function. So one activation function is for the linear unit. The linear unit is a neuron that has. The, the, whose activation function is the identity function. It takes the input and just returns it, applying no change to it. Uh, we've seen the threshold activation function or the sign uh, activation function. Sometimes it's called the threshold unit. A threshold unit takes a real number and uh, checks if it's greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, it says plus one, else it says minus one. A popular activation function for uh, uh, binary type classification is the sigmoid. Unit. The sigmoid unit applies the sigmoid function that we saw last in the last lecture with logistic regression. Another activation function that uh, um, became extremely popular um, around uh, 2011 or so is something called the rectified linear unit. It takes a number, uh, in this case, it takes the number z, and it checks. If that number is more than zero, it just gives it, returns it as it is. If that number is less than zero, it uh, flattens it to zero. Tan x is another popular activation function which applies the tan x function, hyperbolic tangent. And there are other activation functions that exist in the literature. I see that I don't have the most recent version of my slide, which is unfortunate, but uh, that's okay. There are other activation functions that uh, exist in the literature. Um, for example, uh, the transformer neural network um, internally uses an activation function called, at least one version of it, uses an activation called the GELU. Um, there's something called a swish. There's like a whole 
uh, cottage industry is devoted to inventing activation functions. Let's just uh, look at these functions, the, the plots of these functions to kind of give you a sense. The linear activation function simply takes the input and returns it as it is. A threshold is something we've seen for the uh, linear classifier. If the input is uh, here, you have Z and here output. Uh, if the input is more than uh, zero, it converts it to one. If it's less than zero, it converts it to minus one. Notice that the threshold activation function is not linear, it's not differentiable, and it's not even continuous, but it's an activation function. Tan H can be seen as a soft version of a threshold. Tan H activation behaves very much like the threshold at the limits, and in between, it kind of fixes the problem that threshold is uh, has a step. Another activation function is the sigmoid. Sigmoid is basically uh, a squashed tan H. In fact, it's mathematically that. Um, while the tan H was ranging from minus one to one, sigmoid is from zero to one. And then there's the rectified linear unit, which says on one side, it just copies over the input. On the positive side, on the negative side, it just uh, uh, erases the input and makes it zero. And there are other activation functions also. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, do you have to use all the features at once in a given neuron, or can you parallelize computations by dividing it in uh, into several neurons, and will it make a difference? So, a lot of uh, uh, in practice, a lot of the computation that happens in the neural network is in parallel, and that's one of the reasons why GPUs are extremely useful because GPUs can do a lot of this computation in parallel. So, parallel versus not parallel is uh, uh, is is an implementation detail that doesn't really concern itself to how it how it behaves mathematically. Yeah. And other thing that I wanted to speak of parallel and not parallel in the 1980s, um, neural networks when it was the last time neural networks were the previous time neural networks were uh, in the news a lot was in the 1980s. At which point some uh, in some literature it was not it was not called neural networks or deep learning. But it was called connectionism or connectionist models. Uh, sometimes people call it parallel distributed processing (PDP). There are a couple of books called parallel distributed distributed processing, which, if you have time, I would highly recommend it. Uh, there was a time in the 1980s when I've heard it was mandatory reading for any graduate student working on AI because it was the the it contained everything that was that one needs to know about connection is smart, aka neural networks. Uh, things have changed since then, but still I would recommend, if you really want to dive deep into this, I would recommend those books because uh, a lot of the ideas that we encounter today that show success today, you can see their origins in those books. So let's uh, formally define a neural network. A neural network is a function. It's a function that converts some inputs, usually vectors, to outputs. Could be vectors, could be scalars, could be uh, scalars are just real numbers. Could be um, uh, 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 discrete outputs. One way or another, it's defined using a directed acyclic graph. The directed acyclic graph contains nodes and edges. Nodes are typically, but not necessarily, organized in layers. And these nodes correspond to what I just called neurons. Edges connect the nodes, they are directed, um, and they carry information, the output of one neuron to another. And each edge is associated with a weight. And to answer a question that came up before, you can't have cycles because the definition of a neural network includes a cycle. By definition, these objects cannot have cycles. It turns out if you have cycles, it makes the algorithms, uh, uh, the, the rather, the algorithms that we look at assume that there are no cycles. So here's a uh, an example that uh, I'll occasionally show. You have a few layers here, three layers in this case. There are nodes, and let's assume that all the edges are directed upwards. So the uh, I, I don't want to put arrows on every one, but you get. Uh, Every edge has an arrow pointing 
from the input to the output. The nodes are organized in layers. Every node is a neuron. Every edge, um, uh, every edge ca carries information from one neuron to another, and it's associated with weight. And the semantics of the node and the edges is exactly what we saw before. Um, the edges bring information as a vector. The node kind of contains weight and uh, a bias. Where any input comes in, the node takes the dot product and applies an activation function. Questions? Uh, yes, you, you. Do you often go from the higher output or does it depend on the task? Depends on the task. I've seen all uh, all possibilities. Um, it depends on the task, but more importantly, it also is a design choice. I, I'll, I'll keep talking about design choices uh, when we talk about these neural networks because this is a family of functions that are defined by a graph. One of the design choices we have is what that graph connectivity is and how many nodes and edges there are. And so all of those combinations, you know, you can go from a small number of inputs to a very wide hidden layer back to small or things like that. You, 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 uh, there are uh, all possibilities in the literature. Uh, Oh, uh, good question. Uh, in this case, yeah, this, this is a notation that I will use later on, so I might as well just mention it here. Um, here, W, I, J, uh, 1 means the weight associated with the, uh, the node going from node I in the first in the input layer to node J in the output layer. I'm oh, sorry, in the hidden layer. So it's let me write it this way. W input node comma um, target actually no not input. It's a graph, right? So I can have source node target layer. This is just some convention that I made up of to so that I can address every element here uh, and every edge separate. Can you have more than, can you use more than, this is a good question, can you use more than one activation function in the different layers? Technically, nothing prevents you. Technically, nothing prevents you from using a different activation function in every single neuron. In practice, that can get a little overwhelming. So, uh, we usually just decide all the layers have a certain activation function. The only place where the act choice of the activation function really matters is that the output layer. For instance, if you have a regression problem, then your output needs to be any real number. So you need an activation that can produce any real number. One activation that can produce any real number is the linear activation, linear material. If your output is, a, uh, uh, is some sort of a classification problem, you can use choose an activation that produces a probability for that class. One such activation is uh, if you have um, Binary classification, one such activation is the big one. If you have multi class classification, I haven't talked about it yet. Um, if you have multi class classification, and it turns out the natural thing to do is to have one output node for each class and then normalize the out, uh, or their output so that they form a probability. And the activation there is called softmax. We'll talk about that later. But uh, to define this neural network, what do you need to specify? You need to specify what is the structure of this graph, meaning what are the nodes, what are the edges, and what's the connectivity, which nodes are connected to which one. You need to specify the activation functions on every single node. And you also need to specify what the weights on each of the edges are. There's a lot that goes in this. The first two, typically, they are called the architecture of the neural network. Uh, the architecture is simply the design of the function. It does not say which what uh, what the parameters are, just the structure of the nodes, the structure of the graph, and the activations. And uh, typically, when we talk about using a neural network to address a certain problem, we assume that um, someone uh, usually asks, "We have already decided on the architecture 
uh, that in a way that doesn't depend necessarily on the data because it's only the edge weights that are going to be learned from data. When we talk about learning a neural network, we only talk about learning the parameters. The, the edge weights are typically called the parameters. Learning the, uh, you could ask, is it possible to learn the architecture itself? Is it possible to learn the layout and the, of the graph and all the escalation functions? The search space for that is ridiculously large, which is why it's almost often never attempted. Uh, I say almost often because there is actually a line of work on something called neural architecture search, which tries to discover good architectures for a certain task and then learn parameters for that, or maybe learn parameters jointly. It's just an extremely hard learning problem. So it is uh, both uh, rare and often unstable. Uh, because if you depend on uh, things like initialization and uh, uh, the random seed and the day of the week and whether there's an eclipse and what the weather is and all that, uh, there are too many factors that go into deciding whether, an uh, whether the architecture works. Yes. Um, I believe it is. It may be. I, I, I have to look it up. It seems like it should. It, to me, if I have to guess, I would say it is harder than NP hard. I would. Say, yeah, I, I believe it might be as hard as counting the number of satisfying solutions to a formula, which is a complexity class called sharp P. Uh, but I don't have a proof in my head, so I can't really come into that. So in the, there's a question, why are there two outputs in the schematically shown neural network? Why do I have two output nodes? Um, I could have, if I have a binary classification task, one is sufficient technically. But the reason I have two output nodes is to point out that the output can be a vector. In fact, another reason to have two output nodes is imagine that you have two labels. I could get a prediction for two labels using just one node. A linear classifier can do that, right? I mean, uh, I get a, uh, I get a score, um, and then I apply a threshold activation to that. Alternatively, if you have two labels, let's call this spam and not spam. I could have two outputs, one for each label, and then if the 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 score on the spam node is higher than the score on the not spam, then I predict uh, spam. Otherwise, I predict not spam. You could generalize this for more than two classes. This is a, this is how we do multi-class classification in your life. You have as many outputs as you have labels, and then you take the uh, node, the 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 output the, the prediction of that model is the label corresponding to the output node that has the highest value. Uh, and if you want a probability, you can normalize all those things into a, uh, a distribution. Yes. Specifically with respect to binary classification, there isn't any. Um, there isn't any, and I think it's possible to prove it mathematically. Uh, however, there is a there isn't any sort of uh, expressiveness advantage. However, there is a slight advantage in terms of implementation, in that you just need to implement multi-class and you get binary for free. You don't need to implement two different things and have a special case. Uh, so you write less code or you have more maintainable code. That's pretty much the only advantage. Okay. Neural networks have been around for a very long time. Um, the first modern artificial neural network was proposed in 1943 by Makalo and Pitt, and they showed how certain linear threshold units can compute uh, logical functions. We've seen that when we talked about linear, linear models. Uh, in 1949, Hebb um, suggested a learning rule that has some biological plausibility. Today it's called Hebbian learning. Uh, then 1950s, it's not 1950, but 1950s, uh, Rosenblatt came along with the Professor algorithm for a single uh, threshold neuron, namely the linear classifier. But uh, uh, there was also work on multi-layer perceptrons around that time. In 1969, there was an influential, influential book by uh, uh, Minsky and Papert called Perceptrons, which 
simultaneously introduced a new way to look at uh, these classes of models, this geometric perspective, and uh, have some really cool analysis. And also, uh, at the same time, it was uh, it came at a time in history when uh, there was um, AI was considered a field that has more hype than substance. Uh, and it also pointed out that a lot of the hype is mathematically impossible. So sometimes in, in certain sort of uh, fanciful versions of this history, this book was responsible for killing funding in AI. Turns out it was not exactly that, but uh, yeah, it's a nice story. Uh, anyway, so then in the 1970s and the 1980s, um, we saw some work on something called the convolutional neural network. Um, the convolutional neural network is, was based on some studies of uh, the, re the retina of cats. Um, and um, Fukushima defined a certain model, which he had then then improved upon to create what we current, uh, the, the thing that we currently think of as a convolutional neural network. In the 1980s, also in the 70s already, there was work on what we today call the backpropagation algorithm. Uh, late 80s, there's something called the recurrent neural network that was uh, proposed. All of these are different architectures, different specific architectures. The convolutional neural network is especially well suited for processing things like images. Recurrent neural networks are especially well suited for processing sequences. We won't be looking at either one of these in this class simply because uh, that if you are interested in that, I would suggest attending the deep learning class because that's its own thing. But uh, all of these ideas remained sort of um, uh, proof of concept until the 2000s, because uh, until such a time, until uh, until the 2000s, it was very hard to get a lot of data. These models have massive sample complexity, which means that you need a lot of data to train. But when you have when you have a lot of data to train them, you can't just run code on uh, computers from the 1970s because those are slow. So you need a lot of compute. You need a lot of data. You need a lot of compute. You need a lot of memory. And uh, around the 2000s, all these things came together. Moore's law uh, made processors very very cheap, um, and memory also very cheap. The internet came along, and data collection became easy. Um, and as a result, these neural networks got deeper. And along the way, between the 90s and the 2000s, we understood a lot more about machine learning. We understood things like sample complexity, uh, things like regularization, capacity control, the risk of overfitting, and all the stuff that we saw. It led us to better optimization algorithms. And these things came together, and that has led to the explosion of neural networks today. The most uh, recent uh, types of architectures that were invented include the transformer neural network and graph neural networks, which are from 2010 to transformers from 2017. And uh, transformers especially uh, drive everything that we think about as success in AI today, um, chat GPT and all of those things. So you can trace the history back to 1943, and each of these pieces still satisfy the same rules that we saw. They have a, a, a directed acyclic graph where every node does what I just said. There's an activation function, and we keep building layer upon layer of this with very, very interesting and complicated architectures. And along the way, for certain types of shapes of architectures, you give them names. You call them attention. You call, you call it a recurrent cell. You call it a convolution in such things. These are specific uh, sort of building blocks that we can piece together. We've just encountered a new class of functions. So it's important to think about what these functions can do, what kinds of uh, concepts. Yes. We've, uh, one of the simplest version of this we've seen quite a bit. A uh, single neuron with threshold activation is nothing but a linear threshold unit or a linear classifier. And it can it corresponds to a hyperplane. It can represent anything that a hyperplane represents. If you have two layers with threshold units, you can close off convex shapes in uh, in the instance space and say the inside is positive and the outside is negative. One way to think about that is every 
edge of this shape is a linear classifier and the region inside is a conjunction of all of those things. One layer can represent a conjunction, the layer below represents uh, um, each of those edges. With three layers, you can have unions of convex polygons and uh, you can draw co uh, complicated, you can kind of close out complicated shapes in the instant space. This picture must uh, uh, make you think that you can draw any shape with uh, a certain number of layers. And it turns out that's true. Uh, in fact, it, it, there are standard celebrated results. Uh, this result from Saibenko in 1989 is very popular. Um, says that any continuous function can be approximated to arbitrary accuracy using only one hidden layer meaning a two-layer neural network, the kind that we saw before, where the hidden layer has sigmoid unit and the sigmoid activation, and the output layer has no activation, just linear. Uh, the output layer has only one node. That object can express any continuous function to any accuracy that you want. It turns out that seems pretty crazy. That, 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 that seems impressive. You can, you can approximate any continuous function. The hidden thing inside that is the number of hidden layer nodes you need. You can do that, but provided you are allowed to use an arbitrary number of hidden units. So that's called the width of the hidden layer. If your hidden layer width is approaching infinity, your approximation of the function will get more and more close. But it's still, a, it's still a important result because uh, you see this being referred to in some even modern literature. Uh, where they say that, you, that because of this result, neural networks are called universal function approximations. Um, this approximation error, it turns out, within, within reason, is not sensitive to the choice of the activation function. Uh, in, in, but there are like some uh, caveats to that, you should check out the paper. It's easy to prove that a two-layer neural network with only threshold activations can express any Boolean function. Uh, you should try to prove this. The way you would go about it, if you want to prove it, is to notice that a one-layer neural network with threshold can represent any conjunctions with negations thrown in, or any disjunction. And any Boolean function can be written as a conjunction of disjunctions or a disjunction of conjunctions. And so, if you take that argument forward, you'll be able to prove it. We've talked about VC dimensions. Um, if you have a threshold network, the VC dimension of a threshold network with uh, whose edges are the set E is the number of edges times the log of number of edges. The VC dimension of a sigmoid network is uh, roughly the number of edges squared. It's bounded, uh, it depends on the number of edges. So really, one way or another, the VC dimension is a function of the number of parameters because every edge corresponds to a parameter. Any questions about any of these things? Yes, one of them is the upper bound, the other one is the lower bound. Big O means it's contained in that set. Lower bound is it's at least that much. Couple of exercises here. You should try to prove that two layer threshold networks can express any Boolean function. And also try to prove to yourself that if you have only linear units throughout the network, namely in every node, you only have a linear activation, you do not change the expressiveness at all. You, you don't get any gain in expressiveness no matter how many layers you have. This is a fun proof to think about. Questions? As you stare at this, notice that the VC dimension of neural networks can be massive. So just to put these, uh, these bounds in context, E is the number of edges. Today, the largest neural networks 
GPT-4, for example, has a trillion parameters. A trillion squared is has a lot of zeros. <laughs> and if the sample complexity, which depends on the VC dimension, is grows even linearly with a trillion square, we don't have those many examples to train anything. The success of neural networks is also a failure of computational learning theory. These bounds are extremely loose. We don't know why neural networks work. We don't have very strong theory. So those of you who find computational learning theory exciting and want to become rich and famous, well, famous, uh, think about solving these questions. Yeah, you don't get uh, rich for doing math unless you go into hedge funds and such things. Okay, we have what six minutes left. I'm going to get started, but not end this question of how do you make predictions with neural networks? Sometimes this is called the forward pass. In fact, almost all the time, this is called the forward pass. So we are going to talk about how neural networks make predictions. As an illustration, I'm going to use this cartoon neural network with one hidden layer and a grand total of uh, one to five neurons. These gray nodes are just uh, the bias of actually just three neurons because these are the inputs. They don't count. You have inputs here, so that doesn't matter. Um, so just to give some names here, I'm using X to name the inputs, Z is to name the hidden unit, and Y is the output. And we have these bias terms that are always one. And let's just say that the hidden unit uses a sigmoid activation, and the output uses a linear activation. In other words, the output of the network is whatever value is computed at the dot product. And the naming convention that I'm using for the weight Every edge corresponds to a weight. So uh, the naming convention is what I wrote before. Uh, you have, this is a weight that goes into the output layer from the zeroth node here to the first. I don't know why I did that. From the zeroth node there to the first node there. Um, this is a weight that goes from into the hidden unit from a node number two on both sides. It's just a, I just need some way to address each uh, element in every edge in this graph. So how does prediction work? Let's say we have some input, shaded nodes mean that we have the value of that. So let's say we have some input x, which means we know the value of x1 and x2. Of course, we know the value of 1, which is always 1. So we can now compute the value of z1. Z1 is simply the sigmoid activation applied to the linear transformation of the input. So it is sigmoid applied to uh, this weight times this value, which is here, this weight times this value, which is here, this weight times this value, which is here, add them up, you get a number, apply a sigmoid transformation, that's the value of Z1. You can do the same thing to Z2. And now you have the value of Z1 and Z2 and 1, of course, which means now we can compute the value of y. And in the same process, you know, you just, each of these edges contribute to the uh, uh, value of y, you, uh, and you multiply by the appropriate weights. And what I've just done is the forward pass. The input has been propagated forward uh, along this directed epicyclic graph till we get to the output. Now, in general, the rule is before visiting a node, any node, you need to make sure that all the children of that node, or all the nodes that serve as inputs to it, have been visited. Which means if you go from the input stage by stage, you will eventually get to the output because you have a directed acyclic graph. This process is the forward pass. There's really nothing complicated or fancy about this. It's about the most obvious thing that you can imagine, except you need to write some code that implements this. Not you need to, but uh, you won't need to because I'm not going to make you do it for this class, but uh, that's how it is. Someone needs to write that code. Any questions about this? This is, yes. Uh, it's a uh, lot of the previous question. Someone asked uh, for 
Uh -huh. And uh, if you look at some Z1 and Z2 down, down. What do you mean similar? Uh, Z1 has uh, Z from 1, Z1 has Z3. And Z2 has the same. Yeah, these three. Yes. Yeah. And, and from Z1 and Z2, you see, up. Mm -hmm. everything is the same. You have an X to Z. Sure. So, given the fact that it is what makes uh, w11 out and w21 out we haven't yet covered back propagation, but the answer to that question depends on your initialization. If your initial values were different, that will that will change. If all your initial initial weights were zero, then all the, the updates will uh, what you said will happen. But if all your initial weights were different, randomly chosen, then you will uh, these models will uh, that's pretty much all you need. To guarantee that they will end up in different places. We'll talk about we, you can think about that when we come to back propagation. Two minutes left, and I'm going to just introduce a notational convenience that I'll bring back later. So typically, these nodes in the networks represent um, can represent single numbers, but sometimes we have nodes representing entire vectors. So you rather than having a node that represents each neuron separately. You treat this whole thing as a node. Um, so the node is the entire vector. Sometimes it's an entire matrix, or sometimes it's an entire tensor. A tensor is nothing but if a matrix is a two dimensional array of numbers, a tensor is an n dimensional array of numbers. So you can have a node called x, which represents the vector x0, x1, x2, which uh, produces a vector called z, which is nothing but these three things. And all these edges are packed into a matrix. So Z is nothing but the activation applied to the product of the matrix W with the vector X. And similarly, yeah, so you can write Z as sigmoid applied to W times X. And each element of Z is uh, generated, uh, the sigmoid is applied um, uh, independently on each element of Z. And similarly, the output y is the dot product of the vector w with the vector x. So the uh, I have a w o there, and I can think of uh, y as w o times the uh, the vector z. So you can write the entire neural network compactly using this sort of notation rather than having this ugly um, um, edge and node graph. There's no activation here because the output is defined to be linear. This is a notational convenience. This plot, this picture here, represents exactly the same thing on this side, except I'm packing more information into the nodes. Why? Because if I have to draw a network with a trillion parameters, there's not enough room to actually do this. Um, it allows us to kind of think about large neural networks without the cognitive load of maintaining uh, all the nodes and edges. And more importantly, it allows us to actually write code that uh, operates over tensors and it just generalizes to everything. And the cool thing about having mat matrix uh, multiplication uh, as the building block is you can take advantage of GPUs, which are essentially matrix multiplication engines. So they can do this process super efficiently at scale. And that's one of the reasons why NVIDIA stock is uh, so high because they build the GPUs. All right, I'll stop here. Um, we've covered the forward path. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll be looking at the backpropagation algorithm and then uh, get into the practical concerns with your network.